Chapter 2 of The Way of Peace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sunny Abdullah Chapter 2 The Two Masters, Self and Truth Upon the battlefield of the human soul two masters are ever contending for the crown of supremacy, for the kingship and dominion of the heart. The master of self, called also the prince of this world, and the master of truth, called also the father god. The master's self is that rebellious one whose weapons are passion, pride, avarice, vanity, self-will, implements of darkness. The master truth is that meek and lowly one whose weapons are gentleness, patience, purity, sacrifice, humility, love, instruments of light. In every soul the battle is waged, and as a soldier cannot engage at once in two opposing armies, so every heart is enlisted either in the ranks of self or of truth. There is no half and half course. There is self and there is truth. Where self is, truth is not. Where truth is, self is not. Thus spake Buddha, the teacher of truth, and Jesus, the manifested Christ declared that no man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Truth is so simple, so absolutely undeviating and uncompromising, that it admits of no complexity, no turning, no qualification. Self is ingenious, cropped, and, governed by subtle and snaky desire, admits of endless turnings and qualifications, and the deluded worshippers of self vainly imagine that they can gratify every worldly desire, and at the same time possess the truth. But the lovers of truth worship truth with the sacrifice of self, and ceaselessly guard themselves against worldliness and self-seeking. Do you seek to know and realize truth? Then you must be prepared to sacrifice, to renounce to the utmost, for truth in all its glory can only be perceived and known when the last vestige of self has disappeared. The eternal Christ declared that he who would be his disciple must deny himself daily. Are you willing to deny yourself, to give up your lusts, your prejudices, your opinions? If so, you may enter the narrow way of truth and find that peace from which the world is shut out. The absolute denial the utter extinction of self is the perfect state of truth, and all religions and philosophies are but so many aids to this supreme attainment. Self is the denial of truth. Truth is the denial of self. As you let self die, you will be reborn in truth. As you cling to self, truth will be hidden from you. Whilst you cling to self, your path will be beset with difficulties and repeated pains, sorrows, and disappointments will be your lot. There are no difficulties in truth, and coming to truth, you will be freed from all sorrow and disappointment. Truth in itself is not hidden and dark. It is always revealed and is perfectly transparent. But the blind and wayward self cannot perceive it. The light of day is not hidden except to the blind, and the light of truth is not hidden except to those who are blinded by self. Truth is the one reality in the universe, the inward harmony, the perfect justice, the eternal love. Nothing can be added to it nor taken from it. It does not depend upon any man, but all men depend upon it. You cannot perceive the beauty of truth while you are looking out through the eyes of self. If you are vain, you will color everything with your own vanities. If lustful, your heart and mind will be so clouded with the smoke and flames of passion that everything will appear distorted through them. If proud and opinionative, you will see nothing in the whole universe except the magnitude and importance of your own opinions. There is one quality which preeminently distinguishes the man of truth from the man of self, and that is humility. To be not only free from vanity, stubbornness, and egotism, but to regard one's own opinions as of no value. This indeed is true humility. 
he who is immersed in self regards his own opinions as truth, and the opinions of other men as error. But that humble truth lover who has learned to distinguish between opinion and truth, regards all men with the eye of charity, and does not seek to defend his opinions against theirs, but sacrifices those opinions, that he may love them all, that he may manifest the spirit of truth. For truth in its very nature is ineffable and can only be lived. He who has most of charity has most of truth. Men engage in heated controversies, and foolishly imagine that they are defending the truth, when in reality they are merely defending their own petty interests and perishable opinions. The follower of self takes up arms against others. The follower of truth takes up arms against himself. Truth, being unchangeable and eternal, is independent of your opinion and of mine. We may enter into it, or we may stay outside, but both our defence and our attack are superfluous, and are hurled back upon ourselves. Men, enslaved by self, passionate, proud, and condemnatory, believe their particular creed or religion to be the truth, and all other religions to be error, and they proselytize with passionate ardour. There is but one religion, the religion of truth. There is but one error, the error of self. Truth is not a form of belief. It is an unselfish, holy, and aspiring heart. And he who has truth is at peace with all, and cherishes all with thoughts of love. You may easily know whether you are a child of truth or a worshipper of self if you will silently examine your mind, heart, and conduct. Do you harbour thoughts of suspicion, enmity, envy, lust, pride, or do you strenuously fight against these? If the former, you are chained to self, no matter what religion you may profess. If the latter, you are a candidate for truth, even though outwardly you may profess no religion. Are you passionate, self-willed, ever seeking to gain your own ends, self-indulgent and self-centered? Or are you gentle, mild, unselfish, quit of every form of self-indulgence and are ever ready to give up your own? If the former, self is your master. If the latter, truth is the object of your affection. Do you strive for riches? Do you fight with passion for your party? Do you lust for power and leadership? Are you given to ostentation and self-praise? Or have you given up the love of riches? Have you relinquished all strife? Are you content to take the lowest place and to be passed by unnoticed? And have you ceased to talk about yourself and regard yourself with self-complacent pride? If the former, even though you may imagine you worship God, the God of your heart is self. If the latter, even though you may withhold your lips from worship, you are dwelling with the Most High. The signs by which the truth lover is known are unmistakable. Here the holy Krishna declared them in Sir Edward Arnold's beautiful rendering of the Bhagavad Gita. Fearlessness, singleness of soul, the will always to strive for wisdom, open hand and govern appetites, and piety, and love of lonely study, humbleness, uprightness, heed to injure naught which lives, truthfulness, slowness unto wrath, a mind that lightly letteth go what others prize, and equanimity, and charity, which spieth no man's faults, and tenderness towards all that suffer, a contented heart, flattered by no desires, a bearing mild, modest and grave, with manhood nobly mixed, with patience, fortitude and purity, an unrevengeful spirit, never given to rate itself too high. Such be the signs, O Indian Prince, of him whose feet are set on that fair path which leads to heavenly birth. When men, lost in the devious ways of error and self, have forgotten the heavenly birth, the state of holiness and truth, they set up artificial standards by which to judge one another, and make acceptance of, and adherence to, 
their own particular theology, the test of truth, and so men are divided one against another, and there is ceaseless enmity and strife, and unending sorrow and suffering. Reader, do you seek to realize the birth into truth? There is only one way. Let self die. All those lusts, appetites, desires, opinions, limited conceptions and prejudices to which you have hitherto so tenaciously clung, let them fall from you. Let them no longer hold you in bondage, and truth will be yours. Cease to look upon your own religion as superior to all others, and strive humbly to learn the supreme lesson of charity. No longer cling to the idea, so productive of strife and sorrow, that the Saviour whom you worship is the only Saviour, and that the Saviour whom your brother worships with equal sincerity and ardour is an impostor. But seek diligently the path of holiness, and then you will realise that every holy man is a Saviour of mankind. The giving up of self is not merely the renunciation of outward things, it consists of the renunciation of the inward sin, the inward error. Not by giving up vain clothing, not by relinquishing riches, not by abstaining from certain foods, not by speaking smooth words, not by merely doing these things is the truth found, but by giving up the spirit of vanity, by relinquishing the desire for riches, by abstaining from the lust of self-indulgence, by giving up all hatred, strife, condemnation, and self-seeking, and becoming gentle and pure at heart. By doing these things is the truth found. To do the former and not to do the latter is Phariseeism and hypocrisy, whereas the latter includes the former. You may renounce the outward world, and isolate yourself in a cave or in the depths of a forest, but you will take all your selfishness with you, and unless you renounce that, great indeed will be your wretchedness and deep your delusion. You may remain just where you are, performing all your duties, and yet renounce the world, the inward enemy. To be in the world, and yet not of the world, is the highest perfection, the most blessed peace, is to achieve the greatest victory. The renunciation of self is the way of truth. Therefore, enter the path. There is no grief like hate, no pain like passion, no deceit like sense. Enter the path. Far hath he gone whose foot treads down one fond offence. As you succeed in overcoming self, you will begin to see things in their right relations. He who is swayed by any passion, prejudice, like or dislike, adjusts everything to that particular bias, and sees only his own delusions. He who is absolutely free from all passion, prejudice, preference and partiality, sees himself as he is, sees others as they are, sees all things in their proper proportions and right relations, having nothing to attack, nothing to defend, nothing to conceal, and no interest to guard, he is at peace. He has realized the profound simplicity of truth, for this unbiased, tranquil, blessed state of mind and heart is the state of truth. He who attains to it dwells with the angels, and sits at the footstool of the Supreme, knowing the great law, knowing the origin of sorrow, knowing the secret of suffering, knowing the way of emancipation in truth. How can such a one engage in strife and condemnation? For though he knows that the blind, self-seeking world, surrounded with the clouds of its own illusions, and enveloped in the darkness of error and self, cannot perceive the steadfast light of truth, and is utterly incapable of comprehending the profound simplicity of the heart that has died or is dying to self. Yet he also knows that when the suffering ages have piled up mountains of sorrow, the crushed and burdened soul of the world will fly to its final refuge, and that when the ages are completed, every prodigal will come back to the fold of truth. And so he dwells in good will toward all, and regards all with that tender compassion which a father bestows upon his wayward children. Men cannot understand truth because they cling to self, because they believe in and love self, 
because they believe self to be the only reality, whereas it is the one delusion. When you cease to believe in and love self, you will desert it, and will fly to truth, and will find the eternal reality. When men are intoxicated with the wines of luxury and pleasure and vanity, the thirst of life grows and deepens within them, and they delude themselves with dreams of fleshy immortality. But when they come to reap the harvest of their own sowing, and pain and sorrow supervene, then, crushed and humiliated, relinquishing self and all the intoxications of self, they come, with aching hearts to the one immortality, the immortality that destroys all delusions, the spiritual immortality in truth. Men pass from evil to good, from self to truth, through the dark gate of sorrow, for sorrow and self are inseparable. Only in the peace and bliss of truth is all sorrow vanquished. If you suffer disappointment because your cherished plans have been thwarted, or because someone has not come up to your anticipations, it is because you are clinging to self. If you suffer remorse for your conduct, it is because you have given way to self. If you are overwhelmed with chagrin and regret because of the attitude of someone else toward you, it is because you have been cherishing self. If you are wounded on account of what has been done to you or said of you, it is because you are walking in the painful way of self. All suffering is of self. All suffering ends in truth. When you have entered into and realized the truth, you will no longer suffer disappointment, remorse and regret and sorrow will flee from you. Self is the only prison that can ever bind the soul. Truth is the only angel that can bid the gates unroll. And when he comes to call thee, arise and follow fast. His way may lie through darkness, but it leads to light at last. The woe of the world is of its own making. Sorrow purifies and deepens the soul, and the extremity of sorrow is the prelude to truth. Have you suffered much? Have you sorrowed deeply? Have you pondered seriously upon the problem of life? If so, you are prepared to wage war against self and to become a disciple of truth. The intellectual who does not see the necessity for giving up self frame endless theories about the universe and call them truth. But do thou pursue that direct line of conduct which is the practice of righteousness Thou wilt realize the truth which has no place in theory, and which never changes. Cultivate your heart. Water it continually with unselfish love and deep-felt pity, and strive to shut out from it all thoughts and feelings which are not in accordance with love. Return good for evil, love for hatred, gentleness for ill-treatment, and remain silent when attacked. So shall you transmute all your selfish desires into the pure gold of love, and self will disappear in truth. So you will walk blamelessly among men, yoked with the easy yoke of lowliness, and clothed with the divine garment of humility. And thou, in the heart of the master of Ruth, across self-stirred desert why wilt thou be driving? A thirst for the quickening waters of truth when here. By the path of thy searching and sinning, flows life's gladsome stream, lies love's oasis green. Come, turn thou and rest, know the end and beginning, the sort and the searcher, the seer and the seen. Thy master sits not in the unapproached mountains, nor dwells in the mirage which floats on the air, nor shalt thou discover his magical fountains and pathways of sand that encircle despair. In selfhood's dark desert, cease weary seeking the odorous tracks of the feet of thy king. And if thou wouldest hear the sweet sound of his speaking, be deaf to all voices that emptily sing. Flee the vanishing places, renounce all thou hast, leave all that thou lovest, and, naked and bare, thyself at the shrine of the inmost caste, the highest, the holiest, the changeless is there. Within, in the heart of the silent he dwelleth. Leave sorrow and sin, leave thy wandering soul. Come bathe in his joy, whilst he, 
whispering, telleth thy soul what it seeketh, and wander no more. Then cease, weary brother, thy struggling and striving, find peace in the heart of the master of Ruth. Across self's dark deserts cease weary driving. Come, drink at the beautiful waters of truth. End of chapter 2 Recording by Sunny Abdullah